So thank you for um, inviting me. Um, it was hard to know how to um, judge this presentation. So I've kind of gone for um, an overview of all things really at the beginning. And then those of you who know me know that my particular interests are breach presentation and hip dysplasia. Um, and because um, in um, April of this year, the updated guidelines and standards for NIPE, um, the main difference was the hip screening. So I'm particularly going to focus on that. But then at the end, um, there are a number of resources that I've put together on one slide that will be available um, for everyone. So I'm going to go through risk factors that we need to consider before examining a baby at, just after birth, um, any postnatal examination, um, definitely um, NIPE examinations. Um, think about the observations that we undertake on a baby and how we do that. As I've mentioned, um, I'll particularly focus on hip dysplasia in this presentation. And then there are some resources um, and references um, for everyone to have a look at. Um, so following on from the first presentation, um, obviously a lot um, is related to genetics and the development um, of the fetus. So if we think about the first four risk factors, um, eyes, cataracts, cardiac um, conditions, hip dysplasia, and also um, hearing, which is undertaken by the hearing screeners, um, these all have quite a strong family history. Um, and we're not sure if they all have a genetic um, significance, but you know, increasingly we are finding that. So it is, I would suggest, um, that a lot of these questions should be asked antenatally, and I don't think we always do that. Um, you know, it can be quite difficult sometimes um, when we start the NIPE examination, having to start by asking a whole load of questions. Um, and the mothers might be quite tired, um, the fathers might be present and they might not actually know. Um, so a lot of this, it might be quite helpful if we could think of including these questions um, during the antenatal booking. You know, it would be very helpful for us um, to know if there is any family history of congenital cataracts. We do ask, hopefully, um, if there's any family history of cardiac conditions, um, because then the women um, should be referred for a fetal cardiac scan. Um, and also with the increasing number of diabetics during pregnancy, um, they are also referred for cardiac scans as well. Hip dysplasia, um, the main things are breach, um, as shown here um, in this um, um, sketch by um, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, very important, yet again, um, when we're monitoring the pregnancy to really know if this baby has ever been breech from 36 weeks onwards, because that's very important for us um, in our referrals. Um, also knowing about any family history of um, hearing problems that can just help when it comes to the postnatal period in especially you know during covid increasingly women have gone home very quickly um, from maternity units for a number of reasons um, understandable they wanted to get out of the hospital um, and a lot of these um, things have to be done um, quite early and it can be quite difficult to get a clear response very early in the hearing um, and then those babies have to be followed up. But if we know where there's a family history, we can obviously prioritise those. Um, obviously, at the first examination and the NIPE and every examination, any time you see a baby, um, you know, really look at the baby. And if you've ever got any doubts, a bit like um, was you know, stated in that first presentation, um, if, if you're not sure um, about the appearance of a baby, um, I would go on your gut instinct, um, because not all um, conditions are picked up at birth um, or picked up at the NIPE examination. And often when I do presentations in the university for um, health visitors or um, for people who are coming into health visiting who are being in child nurses, and um, they've all got stories of um, children presenting with cardiac abnormalities um, and then um, being diagnosed as having Down syndrome. It just hasn't been picked up. Um, and also sometimes it can be not missed, but it's not as obvious sometimes um, when babies are born preterm. So these are all factors 
um, we should consider. Um, also, sepsis has become a big issue in healthcare, um, and when caring for babies, we should be, you know, looking out for all the red flags for sepsis. Um, centile and gestation, very important. Whenever you're caring for a baby, you should know what centile the baby is on, and you should be particularly concerned if the baby's on a very low centile. Um, I'm, students will tell you I have a phrase, beware of the 37 weaker. Um, uh, you know, a baby that's born, you know, at 37 weeks or just over 37 weeks, um, depending on the scan, you know, where somebody put the dots on the screen, that baby could have been preterm. It could have been 36 weeks plus five instead of 37 weeks plus one. You really have got to be looking at the behavior of the child and you can't expect them to do um, what a 42 weeker would do. Um, their stores of brown adipose tissue may not be as good. Um, they may have problems initiating feeding and maintaining their um, body temperature. Um, and that all fits in with jaundice as well. So I think if you've got a baby that's on a low centile, most units will want those babies to remain in for about 72 hours. But also I would be cautious of in transferring home babies who are just around 37 weeks um, for very much the same reasons. You know, we want to know that they can feed well. We want to know they can maintain their body temperature. Um, and they do um, increasingly um, present with jaundice that may require treatment. Uh, when we're observing a baby, um, very important always to look at color and tone. Um, I'm a great believer that if the mother's having skin to skin contact, um, that the baby's temperature should be taken while the baby's still with the mother, having the skin to skin, not removing the baby from the mother, um, put it into uh, maybe obviously under a heater, hopefully. Um, but we need to know the baby is OK before we examine a baby, whether it's the first examination or the NIPE examination. Um, we typically start with the cardiorespiratory system because you need to know that a baby is well well before you can carry on with the remainder um, of the examination. Um, I've already mentioned morphology, um, but um, I have um, picked up several babies um, on the NIPE examination um, that have various chromosomal abnormalities. And, um, you know, that wasn't picked up um, at the first examination. So that, you know, we're not, you know, we're not blaming anyone, um, but it is difficult when the parent has been told that their baby is well that to then have to um, say that actually we may have some concerns. Um, and, you know, it's, if the baby's got a heart murmur, something like that, it's easier than to get a second opinion about the heart murmur without alerting parents that you think there's any other issues with their baby. Um, the skeletal system does need... Um, um, particular attention. Um, if you talk to an orthopedic surgeon, they would say that we should examine the hips first and before the baby gets unsettled, uh, because that's their area of um, um, expertise and they would want that to come um, first. But I'll talk more about hip examination when I talk about um, on the next slide hip dysplasia. Um, but in my experience um, of doing examinations, um, I wouldn't underestimate how. Um, upset parents can be when their baby has something like talipes. Um, I probably have seen more children with talipes, um, true talipes, um, rather than positional talipes than hip dysplasia, but they, they do find that quite um, a difficult diagnosis. Uh, and also, you know, the treatment it is quite a lengthy treatment um, with Ponsetti um, treatment. So um, I wouldn't underestimate a diagnosis of um, Talipes. And obviously, looking at all areas, the abdomen of the baby, um, I tell you lots of stories, but you know, we probably haven't got time now. Um, the spine, the reflexes, and also skin, um, noting any birthmarks, um, very important sometimes for referral, um, but also very important for safeguarding. Um, and also, when the skin changes in the first couple of days, some birthmarks may not be that clear. So, it's important on every um, interaction with a baby, um, that if you see a birthmark, that it's actually documented. Um, and if you're not sure, um, always get a second opinion. Um, so just to go on to the main part, probably, of my presentation, um, looking at hip dysplasia. So um, on the 
um, next slide, I'll show you the documents that were published um, in April of this year um, that for people who work in England, there have been some changes to the um, timelines and screening for hip dysplasia. Um, but the main things to remember about hip dysplasia are that it is a rare condition. Um, various studies will tell you anything between one to five in a thousand babies um, may have hip dysplasia. Um, it is predominantly a female condition, which is quite rare um, for male infants to have hip dysplasia. Um, and studies have shown um, that a family history and a baby being breached from 36 weeks um, also increases the risks of hip um, dysplasia. We typically examine the hips during the NIPE examination, and there are two maneuvers, the Ortolani and the Barlow's examination. And I think it's important for anyone who isn't NIPE trained um, or for students, um, you need to know that if, you know, I'm not, but if I was, one of the better examinations people do. I would only pick up 60% of problems if there was hip dysplasia. Um, the one thing for me is that I examine about 500 babies a year. So I have found quite a few babies with hip dysplasia. So I actually know what it feels like. Um, and that is a main problem um, that we have in the whole world um, with the number of examinations that clinicians may undertake, um, you may go through your whole career and never actually find a baby with hip dysplasia um, because it is such a rare condition. We have the hippie doll, um, but from my experience, um, hip dysplasia doesn't feel anything like using um, a hippie doll. Um, and when you feel it, it is actually a very gentle movement, the hip because it's out of joint or will move out of joint, it actually moves very easily. Um, and when we think about risk factors, um, one that I picked up um, probably about two years ago now, um, was the woman's second baby. Um, it was a female infant. The baby had never been breached. And when asked, the mother told me that there was no family history. Both hips were dislocatable um, An ultrasound was undertaken two weeks later that confirmed um, my suspicions and the baby went into a harness um, like this. It's called a public harness, which a child would wear for about six weeks and have regular ultrasounds and checks that the harness is in place. Um, interestingly, um, when the orthopedic surgeon wrote to me to confirm the diagnosis, um, he put in the letter that, of course, when the woman went home with her baby, um, and told the family, then of course the family said, oh yes, uncle such and such had that, and he wore double nappies. So of course this is knowledge that's lost because this is something that somebody much older had when they were a child, um, thankfully um, were cured, and no one ever knew that uncle such and such had to wear double nappies um, because they had hip dysplasia. So when we think that we are screening and we're basing our referral for risk factors on asking parents if the baby's ever been breached or if there's a family history of hip dysplasia. And we're asking this question at the beginning of the NIPE examination. Um, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, I think we really need to think about asking these questions much earlier um, in the pregnancy. So the family have got time to talk to their relatives to see if they really have got any risk factors, um, not just for hip dysplasia, but for a number of conditions. Um, I think we need to be aware of our competency. Um, and even if we are, you know, have a lot of experience and we're good at examining baby's hips, the international studies have shown that the best people, the best you can get is six out of 10 picked up. Um, so, you know, where do any of us really fit into that? Um, the provision of ultrasound, um, that's a very specialist ultrasound, um, graph grading, um, and that kind of, you know, some parents have to travel quite a way um, to get an ultrasound. Um, and then the treatment, if it's picked up early, why do we have all of this? Why are we asking about the risk factors? Why are we doing the hip examination? and wanting an early scan so that a baby can be treated with a parvic harness. Um, and the story, um, going back to that family, I actually bumped into them 
as you know, in, um, the ground floor of St. Thomas's one day um, when I work and um, I recognised the family and just tapped them on the shoulder um, and it does have a happy ending because they were coming for their last appointment um, and if that scan was okay, the baby was coming out of the harness. And then as a complete coincidence, about two weeks ago, um, I examined another baby, of course, end of the afternoon, always. These babies are always or on a Friday afternoon. Um, this situation, second baby again. This one baby was breech and it was female. And there was also a family history. Um, and lo and behold, both hips were um, also dislocatable. And the baby had its hip scan last week um, and went into a harness um, last week. And I'll be following that one up um, as well. So it does sound like an awful lot of intervention, maybe, you know, for every baby, because, you know, we are looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, we're trying to pick up those babies that may have this condition um, so that we can have this closed reduction with the pavlic harness um, and the treatment um, for 95% of babies. They will just wear this for six weeks and that will be the only intervention. Um, if it's not picked up early, it is actually one of the main reasons um, why people have um, hip replacement surgery when they're in their kind of 30s, 40s and 50s um, for late presentation. Um, I think it's important that we don't think that we've missed it. It's, it's, it's a late presentation of the condition. Um, and it's important to remember this used to be called congenital hip dysplasia. We thought that babies were born with it but now it's called developmental hip dysplasia. Um, and very little, um, you know, is completely known about um, the condition. So um, if somebody, if a child um, shows symptoms when they're, you know, a year old, maybe there's a delay in walking or walking with a limp or um, on their toes with one foot or dragging a leg when they're trying to crawl, any of these kind of things, um, they should all be followed up um, and we would describe those as being late presentation um, of the condition. I'll just move on to the resources. So um, the latest guidance um, for midwives who are in um, England can be found in the, the first document. Um, I won't go that through that completely because it's not relevant to everybody. Um, for those of you also um, in the UK, there's an updated um, e-learning, um, and that particularly has a, a great um, resource on doing the hip examination. So I would definitely recommend that. Um, the Steps Charity, um, I believe, are fantastic. They are um, now a worldwide charity, and they provide resources for clinicians and parents for both hip dysplasia and talipes. There are some great little videos on there of the mm. treatments and leaflets um, for parents so that's a great resource and then just thinking about um, other conditions such as cardiac one this link here uh, from the child health um, has got a kind of an a to z of all health conditions so um, you know if you, you're caring for a, a baby um, that you've not come across something before that's a very good um, link um, positive about down syndrome is another excellent organization um, and then Stanford University, um, they have 600 photographs of various conditions from every top to toe of the baby um, that can be used for education. But you can just click onto that. And if you're examining a baby and you're not quite sure, um, you can go onto that um, and you might find um, an image mm -hmm. there that helps you with your diagnosis. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.